Hello everyone. Welcome to the ninth episode of Rondev with the Stalwarts, the show where we discuss the journey of stalwarts in our profession and talk with them about their experiences, projects, and their vision for the future of our industry. I am Daniel Kutur, your host for the show, and in today's episode, I truly feel honored to be speaking to Bill Baker. Bill is a consulting partner at Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, and has an astounding structural engineering experience of over forty years. Bill is regarded as one of the world's leading structural engineers and has designed innovative structures that range in scale from single family homes and small pedestrian bridges to the world's tallest man-made structure the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. His cutting edge designs include the unique Broadgate Exchange House in London which is both a building and a bridge that spans over the Liverpool Street station and the cable supported entry pavilion for General Motors headquarters in Detroit. He has been the recipient of numerous awards from around the globe including the gold medal from iStruct T, the ASC Opel Lifetime Award for Design, the Fazlur Rahman Khan medal from the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat and many many more. So without any further ado, let's jump in straight to our conversation with him. Bill, thank you so much for taking out your time today and joining on this conversation i am so excited and nervous at the same time speaking with you today i'm glad to be here thank you yeah yeah so bill i'd like to start by jogging over your memory during your growing years to know more about what it was that drove you towards civil engineering and then pursue your specialization in structural engineering well i grew up in a small town in the middle of america a town called fulton missouri Okay. It, it, it's a it's a small college town had a, uh, two small private colleges and uh, and other things. It actually had a couple of state institutions, but it was the population is on the order of 10,000 people, so a small place. And um, you know, so in 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 school, you know, I always enjoyed the mathematics and I also enjoyed history and uh, and other topics and uh, and so uh, you know, at some point um, you know, the uh, at the high school, they, the guidance counselor gives you these standard tests about, you know, what are your propensities or what are you interested in? Yes, and yes. It, and it came and it came back with uh, that I was that you know I had a propensity towards engineering. Okay. Okay. And and so I went to ask my mother what an engineer was because I had no idea. And it <laughs> turns out that both of my grandfathers had been engineers, and oh. they both died uh, quite a while before I was born, so I, I never knew them. Okay. And, and then later, uh, my mother didn't say this at the time. Later, it turns out they've both been structural engineers. <laughs> oh, what a coincidence! <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, one of one of them had been a structural engineer, and then later became a a uh, physics professor at the local university, uh, your local college. And uh, the other had been the um, the uh, the uh, city engineer for my town, and had, had done some of the bridges, some of the old bridges around town. Yeah. And and so. Um, so then I looked looked around at the various types of engineering because I didn't know about the structural engineering aspect yet, and I you know looked at and and I thought it would be uh, uh, the engineers that engineering that kind of attracted me the most was the uh, structural engineering because uh, these are the people who did bridges and you know and things that were objects. I thought well that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And so I thought I'd, I'd go on to study that. Uh, and and what, what was also interesting is you know because I, I went to a small town I didn't have any calculus. When I was in high school, I didn't have that until I was in college. Yes. And so I was taking my cal calculus at the same time I was taking uh, my introductory engineering courses. And, and the fact that you could directly um, apply calculus to the deflection of a beam and stuff like that was, you know, that tied it in pretty closely and kind of uh, at the same time. And so yeah. that, that helped me also kind of like, you know, uh, be, uh, I kept my interest in, in that aspect of, uh, of engineering and mathematics. That's great. That's great. So, have you ever given a thought that if you had not been into structural engineering, what else would you have loved to have your career in, and why? <laughs> probably uh, back in the day, I probably would have been an automobile mechanic. But you, you have to remember when I grew up, you could actually work on cars, and you could you could figure out why they were broken because it was all uh, electromechanical and, and uh, with the no computers, you know, none of that stuff. It wasn't working and fix it, and I was pretty. Pretty satisfying. So, I probably would be a, an auto mechanic, probably on classic cars, your ones that that are <laughs> pre, pre electronic age. Yeah. 
uh, our industry is lucky that you chose structural engineering <laughs> okay. so during the design phase of of the burj khalifa and in the past few decades you have been keenly also studying about the tall buildings that were being proposed and were not being built so according to you uh, which were some of the key reasons behind them not being built and what did you learn from those findings uh, that you applied while designing the other tall buildings well, I, I particularly became aware of this while we were designing the Burj Khalifa because it was like a, there are a lot of proposed uh, buildings that are as tall or taller than the Burj Khalifa. And some of them started foundation construction and the like. And uh, one by one, you know, and so I was aware of them. I wasn't really particularly concerned about them. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was aware of them. And one by one, they, they all got canceled. Yes. And, uh, and so I started thinking about... Um, uh, you know, why, not only why buildings get built, but why do buildings not get built? Yes, yes. And, and, and in the process, the things that kind of, uh, that came to mind is a lot of them, they had no clear structural idea or system. Okay. Uh, they were like an architect's sketch that an engineer would go in and try to make it not fall over. Uh, a lot of them were too complicated. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 more, the, ma the more major the structure is, the simpler it needs to be. Yes, yes. Uh, a lot of them were very complicated to build. Um, you know, if you're doing something that, that's a that's a very tall building or very tall, big anything. Yeah. You know, you got to look at the constructability and keep it, keep it, keep it simple. Uh, yes. And, 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 um, and related to that is a lot of them would have been way too slow to build. Uh, uh, time is your enemy. Yes. Like you want to design it and build it and be and get on with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The harder it takes to design and build a project, the more likely it is to can't be canceled. Yeah. Because of the, uh, you know, either political issues or financial issues or, or, or personal issues, somebody passes away or yes, yes. Like and so um yeah, so you need something that you can build quickly and simply. And and that so that's that. A lot of these other proposals uh, didn't do it. A lot of them were also very inefficient, very wasteful of material. Yes. And, and when you're doing something that, that's at the extreme, you got to do it as efficiently as you can. Yes. Because it'll, it'll get burdened by, by, too, by too much material. And then finally, a lot of them were just too big. And, and this, I mean, in a sense, perhaps the architecturally too big. Okay. Uh, well, one of the most important things that uh, that we used or concepts that we used in the design of Burj Khalifa is an understanding of scale. And this, yeah. is, this is very fundamental. Uh, you know, if I were, I always say this often, but if I were twice as tall, I'd be twice as wide and I'd be twice as thick. Yes. And I would weigh eight times as much. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're not going to find a Bill Baker walking around twice as big, twice yes. as tall, because it just doesn't work. Yes, yes. And a lot of people take uh, systems or that work at a, at a smaller scale and try to just scale them up. Now, yes. Uh, and a lot of times, I think of the structural systems, not so much as systems, but uh, I'll sometimes like to refer to them as species, like animal species. Yes. And, and just like certain uh, animals or creatures will exist at certain scales, and as you change scales, uh, you know the you know the, the the animal or the system or the species will change. Yes. And, and so, uh, 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 unlike nature, where um, generally uh, one uh, one creature evolves or one species evolves from another, in our world we can create all new all new systems out of out of nothing other than the understanding of physics. Yeah. Yeah. It needs it needs to uh, respond to physics, but you have. The opportunity to to create something that that doesn't really have a precedent before it's not it's not an evolution of something else but it actually is, is a is a is a new creation you know as they say cut from whole cloth and and so but but you but you have to look for it yes and, and yes. If, if you don't understand the issues of scale that's part of it now uh, there, there's there's the scale of the structure which is related to slenderness and what was this all like that there's also the scale of the architecture, and you have to address those together and separately at the same time. You have to look at them individually, and then as and then how they inter interrelate. And you yeah. have to study both of those scales at the same time. 
And a lot of those buildings that were canceled, uh, sometimes they were just unlucky. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, but, but a lot of them were, um, were just uh, totally ignored. I remember even talking to one of the uh, developers of one of these projects, and I told them, Right out, you know, the, there's no way this building's going to happen, you know, because of this, this, and that. But you know, they were just they 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 convinced themselves that they could do it, and uh, that, that that it was going to be okay, you know. And, yeah. and I and I there's actually there, there's there was a project here in town one time, a, a very tall building was proposed, and and everyone was saying, oh, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And I was looking, I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I, was, I was talking to a con contractor buddy of mine, and we were both we were like, fine, I don't get it. You know, he goes, I don't get it either. Uh, and eventually, <laughs> the, you know, they spent a lot of money, and the job was canceled. Oh. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I think that this understanding of these issues of why buildings don't get built are, are, are pretty, uh, pretty important. Those are really some great points while considering to build us such a massive project. So for the proposed design project of the South Dearborn in Chicago that you were also a part of, which were some of the new technology systems or schemes that you were intending to incorporate in this building at that time? And how would have this tall building industry be benefited if the project had been built at that time? And would it help the US industry and the tall building industry here? Well, it's actually, there's some very, very, very important um, buildings that were never built, and, you know, and the concepts move on. Uh, uh, you know, the brilliant structural engineer uh, Bill measure had a, uh, a did his competition one time for it called the Bank of the Southwest, and they had a brilliant okay. structural system. The building was never realized, but the idea, you know, is still with us over, over time. Uh, Thornton Thomas said he had a, had a proposal for something called Miglin Beitler Tower. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It had some very good ideas, and. Um, and, you know, and so th there's a series of these. And a lot of times uh, you learn as much from the buildings that don't get built as the ones that do. And yes. 7 South Airborne was one of those. And that one was both about the structural system and, and constructability. It was about, well, it was about the structural system, constructability, and and uh, wind and engineering the wind, if you will, or, 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 um, or accommodating the wind or confusing the wind as you like. Uh, you know, uh, so th that had a, a series of, of, of big ideas, a very, very simple structural system um, that could go to, in that case, it was like 600 meters, 2,000 foot yes. uh, uh, height. And, it, it, and then it had office and had residential and then telecommunication, because at that time, telecommunication wasn't so much, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. digital, it was more broadcast. And uh, and so, so we, we did all, all these studies, and, and in particular, uh, we did a lot of work on the wind engineering. Okay. Uh, uh, and so uh, where um, where we, we got the raw data from the wind tunnel, it wasn't just you know, working very closely with RWDI. It was an excellent one. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, uh, we, we went through and, 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 and got the data, the raw data from them. And together, uh, we, we manipulated it and understood it so that we had a fundamental understanding of how to change the problem. Um, uh, one of the things we like to say here is the, the the why is much more important than the what. Yeah. By that I mean, like, say you get a solution or an answer or something, and that's the that's the what. This is what we have. But the real question is, why is that what we're getting? Yeah. And, and so we went uh, back into the into the why. Uh, uh, it had it happened that a few years earlier, I would worked on a project. Uh, in Russia that uh, uh, we were unable to convince the client to do a wind tunnel study, but I was working with uh, Professor Nick Isimov from the University of Western Ontario, who's a, who's a brilliant wind engineer. And, and uh, he kind of walked me through, and he had, happened to have some test data, was a, which was, was similar enough to the building that, that we could use it. And, and so, you know, he, he like step-by-step step walked me through how to use this, this wind tunnel data and how to interpret it and how to apply it and how to calculate the forces and, and the like. And in the process, I learned a, a great deal uh, about, uh, about uh, the wind behavior in tall buildings. Uh, and I learned more on, on, on the, um, on the uh, Seven South Dearborn. And so, yeah. uh, you know, that was very important. And part of it was also about uh, the architectural expression of structure. And, and so uh, this building had, had like a center core with uh, the 
floor is mostly cantilevered off the center core. Okay. And, and but but how do you tell that story? You know, it, you know, it, it's pretty a remarkable idea, which has been done before by others. Uh, but 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 how do you how do you clearly say you know this is special? This is what we do. Yes. Yes. And, but it also had great benefits. So what we did is we we decladded uh, we uncladded uh, parts of it. We created these gaps. And those gaps, the wind would go through and greatly reduce the forces on the building. Yeah, yeah. Like 25%. Yeah. And, and, and over time, you know, we've done that quite a bit. Uh, we, we recently had the building in, the Korea, in China. It's uh, 530 meters tall. It was just finished. And during the design process, we went, uh, I, I flew to the wind tunnel in, in England and an architect and I with some ideas. And, and we went through 18 different uh, refinements to the shape. And in the process, we, we cut the wind forces uh, less than half. And, and, and so in the process, you know, we saved, I don't know, $40 million of structural cost and, and, you, didn't need yeah. a, and you didn't need a, uh, a damping device anymore. Yeah. And, uh, you know, th this whole thing. And so uh, 7 de South Denver was a very important thing. It, it would yeah. have been the most tallest building for a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it would have been the tallest building. And, and what's also interesting about that project, it was, um, it, it it would have fit on a, a one quarter of a city block of Chicago. Yeah. Uh, whereas you go back to the Sears Tower, it, it pretty much needed a whole block. And so yeah. you know, technology had progressed. So it, it was important in many ways. But the fact that it wasn't built doesn't mean that it's not still important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are some great learnings from that project. And I really like the term like you use confusing wind while doing wind engineering. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Bill, I'd like you to share any interesting stories or thoughts from one of the other landmark project that you worked on, the Broadgate Exchange House in London. Uh, yeah, that was a, that was a, uh, I, that was an important project in my career, and it's a very important building. Uh, it um, and it was at that point in the career where I was a senior engineer, but I wasn't, uh, but I was still kind of project more one project at a time focused, or or, or just a short a few projects at a time. Yes, and so I, I could really spend a lot of you know one on you know personal time drawing up the details and the like, and and when I first got involved, there was a, a major development in London for a developer called uh, Sir Stuart Lipton. Okay, and, and the project there have been other aspects of the project that have been done, and this was the this is the piece this this centerpiece that uh, that span over the tracks that they couldn't have much foundations under it, and so I. Um, you know, and and so I, I'd been doing some uh, teaching down at IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology, yeah. uh, where I was teaching in the College of Architecture. I was a, like a structural advisor, and at the time, I'd been studying uh, like the Hancock Tower in Chicago and and others. And yes. I, I don't realize that, but the Hancock in Chicago is actually a tight arch. Yeah, for gravity loads. Uh, even though it's, it looks like this, it doesn't like like a traditional arch like you see behind me. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, uh, it it actually functionally is an arch, and and so I, I my my head was there, and so I, I I was looking at this, and and the there were some other schemes in play, some of which I were like carrying the load up, the tension members, kind of like a project that had been done. Um, there used to be a Federal Reserve building in Minneapolis that that, that had this system, and it was clear to me that that was not. The most efficient, but the arch would be the most direct. And I was able to convince people that this is the way to go. And then um, uh, working with a very brilliant uh, architectural design team led by Bruce Graham, who was, had been the architect on the Hancock Tower and the Sears Tower. Okay. Uh, and, and so, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we worked very, very hard to, um, to um, expose the structure and express the structure. And, and, and Bruce Graham was, was very good at that. And so, so we spent a lot of time on, on, on fire engineering and stuff like that. So we wouldn't have to clad the structure and hide it behind fire, fire protection uh, systems. And, and in the process, once you expose it, you, every, every detail matters. And so, uh, you know, uh, so we did, we did uh, different connections for the tension members, the tension splices, more lap splices, the yeah. compression uh, uh, splices, were more compression. And, you know, and the member sizes changed as you went down and sometimes they go bigger and then smaller because you know, yeah. you know some, some of the loads are going up and some of the load paths are going down until they hit the arch and, and then the whole expression of the arch uh, you know it, itself with the shadow lines you know and and the, the detailing i was working with you know uh, uh, 
my boss at the time was brilliant engineer Hal Angar, and, and and so you know, uh, and so it was of course a large team. But you know, I, I had the pleasure of doing most of the detailing myself, and yeah. and I, and I would uh, then re review them with my architectural colleagues because S my firm is a firm of architects. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And uh, and uh, and and get their critiques. Usually, there's not much, much change. One of the interesting things was is that uh, the uh, the owner and the and the, uh, the the main contractor decided to go out and uh, and once the design was developed, that to bring in some uh, the the final contractors, and and then we went through and we and we went through and reviewed every detail with the with the uh, fabrication erection team, including long term maintenance, and, yeah. and basically. Uh, we then went back and redetailed all the connections again, and, and so that was that was a great experience. Yeah, to work so closely with the people who 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 were going to construct it, and I and I strongly urge that whenever possible, design your building with the contractors involved. Yes, it helps you better understand how they work as well, and the entire yeah. flow of the structure is right in front of you. Yeah, and and the whole thing, you know, uh, contractors are very clever people. You know, they're very yes. creative. No. Yes. It's not just on the architecture and the structural engineering side. It's it's on both sides, and and, and so uh, and also you learn more. And, and the more you deal with contractors and how they build, uh, uh, you can propose designs that you have more confidence in. Yes. I, uh, let me uh, on the Burj Khalifa. Uh, we were unable to convince the contractor, the owner, to allow us to get a contractor on board uh, during the design phase. So, so uh, we had to use our, our own experience as to what we thought the contractors would like to build. Yeah. I, think, I think we got it right uh, because uh, during the interview process, there were like seven contractors that interviewed for, for the project. Okay. And we, we told each of them, we'll change the design if you have a, a better way to build it. And none of them had a proposal to, to change from what we had proposed. That's great. That's great. From all the majestic and beautiful structures from around the world that have been built, which is one project that you wish you should or could have been a part of and why? Also, could you share any thoughts on how differently would you have designed it? Uh, okay. I'll tell you one of the projects I had absolutely nothing to do with that I really love is the Great Court Roof of, of the of British Museum in London. Okay. okay. Uh, that was designed by uh, the, the architect was Norman Foster. The uh, engineering group was, was Burl Hoppel. The, the contractor was Wagner Burl, and uh, and and the engineer mathematician who helped them set it up was a guy named Chris Williams. And, and yes. it's a brilliant design. It's well executed. It's very nice. I've been there many times myself. Uh, what uh, uh, and uh, and one of the things that that for me was always a bit of a challenge is that you know. Uh, there's only one Chris Williams. Um, yes, <laughs> he, he, he's totally brilliant. And so, uh, what I've been doing for the last few years is trying to figure out how would I, uh, what are the uh, not not that I would change the design, but how would I change the design process to make it more accessible? And I've been doing a, a lot of research on that, and, and we've actually developed some very very uh, good processes, which are I'd say quite accessible. To structural engineers and architects okay. that, that give you a, a feedback, and so it, it might be, you know, if I were to redesign it, it might be a little different in the details, but not in the concept. Okay. Uh, and what's quite interesting about that is that that you have this this structure, this roof that it has to span, it has to arch, if you will, over the space, but cannot thrust against the buildings because the, the buildings around it were uh, fairly old masonry structures, and they couldn't take take the kick. And so that's a very challenging problem. And uh, I think the the, the the existing solution is, is brilliant. Yeah. And I, I, I think that I could uh, do something that maybe a little different, uh, but it, uh, I don't know if it'd be any better, but it, yeah. it would be a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. For, for those of you who are interested to know more about this topic, like there are a lot of a YouTube video topic where Bill has spoken about Williams and this project. Bill, that concludes our conversation for the part one of the show. We'll be joining you again for the second part to know more about your structural system inventions and the other amazing projects you worked on.